Hello and welcome. My name is Andreas Geiser. I'm software manager at Qt Quality Assurance. In the next few minutes, we will talk about architecture verification with the Axivian suite and how architecture verification supports you in your own development project. We will first talk about software architecture, why it is a good idea for you to maintain a software architecture in your project and why it is important to do architecture verification for this architecture. Then in the second part, we will talk about the necessary steps for doing architecture verification. And in the third part, we will talk about how architecture verification with the Exhibit Suite works and what kind of results you can expect from it. A software architecture is normally described by a graphical model. We restrict ourselves to a static software architecture here and for that, the model describes components and allowed relations between these components. In the example here, we see three components, A, B, and C, and we have edges or dependencies between them. There is an edge from A to B, meaning that software component A can access software component B, and software component B can access software component C. Why should you maintain a software architecture? An architecture captures the essential ideas of a project with respect to design and implementation, and therefore serves as an important documentation. For example, when new colleagues are joining the team, they can get an overview and get to know how the project ticks internally by looking at the architecture. It also helps with planning changes in everyday development, but also if larger changes have to take place like a refactoring of the code or adding new functionality. The architecture can be used to assess the impact and to talk about the changes. Otherwise, the code has to be inspected, which is very cumbersome and can be incomplete. So there are many advantages of maintaining a software architecture. However, we had to add one word here, the word reliable. So the architecture has to be reliable. It has to reflect what is actually going on in the code to be used for all these nice things that we discussed earlier. How can we assure that an architecture is reliable? We have to make sure that code and architecture model are in sync. We could do this by manual reviews, again, read the code and also read the model, but this is time consuming and error prone. So this is where architecture verification comes to the rescue. This is an automated process that compares code and the architecture model. It's based on static analysis techniques. It's not testing and it finds deviations automatically and early in the process. So now let's find out what we need to do to perform architecture verification. The first ingredient is the architecture model. We already talked about this, but we did not yet answer the question. How can we specify such an architecture model? Where does the architecture model come from? There are many ways to specify an architecture model. For example, if you have not created a model yet, you can use the Gravis Modeler tool, which is contained within the Axivian suite to create your architecture model. You see a screenshot here on the right, but you can also use a new ML tool like Enterprise Architect or IBM Rational Rhapsody to create your models. And you can even have a customized modeling approach, for example, specifying a model with the help of text files. And all these approaches are supported by the verification approach with the Exhibition Suite. We also have to extract information from the source code in the form of a so-called code model. The code model represents entities from the source code, like source files, here displayed as gray document-like elements, and classes or functions, here, functions are represented as red rectangles and dependencies between these entities. Here, we only display call dependencies. So a function can be connected by a blue edge to another function. And this means that this function calls the other function. Where does this code model come from? The code model can automatically be constructed by the Axivian suite when it analyzes the source code project. We see here on the left side a snippet of C code and on the right side the result where we see a lot of different 
entities represented by different node types and shapes and dependencies between these entities represented by edges of different colors. We have an architecture model and a code model. We now have to establish how code elements correspond to architecture components. This is done by a mapping, an assignment of code elements to architecture elements. Again, where does this mapping come from? How can we define it? There are different ways of mapping code to architecture and the correct way for your project depends on the project structure and on your architecture model. You can maintain a mapping manually, for example, by using the Gravis modeler, but the Axiom Suite also provides means to use, for example, naming conventions or hierarchical information to get a mapping automatically, so you do not have to maintain it manually. You can also use information that you maintain if in your model, for example, tagged values to give information how the mapping should look like. After specifying an architecture model, code model, and the mapping between those two models, we have to look at the dependencies within the architecture model and have to specify what they mean for the code. Let us take this excerpt from the code model. For example, here we have four routines, these red rectangles, and there are two calls between routines specified by the blue solid edges below. And now let's look at this specific edge. What does this edge actually represent with regards to the edge that we see in the architecture model up here? So how do we have to interpret the architecture dependencies to match code dependencies? In our running example, dependencies between two components, for instance, the dependency between component B and component C, mean that all functions that are mapped to component B are allowed to call functions that are mapped to component C. This is a very simple interpretation, especially for UML models, there are way more advanced interpretations of these dependencies possible that also include things like required and provided interfaces and so on. After clarifying these four preparatory steps, we will now take a look at how the architecture verification produces its results. The check first iterates over all edges or dependencies in the code model and verifies that they are allowed by the specification given in the architecture model. Let's start with this edge here on the right. This edge represents the fact that in the code, this routine is calling this routine. The architecture verification now computes the corresponding architecture entities for these two routines using the mapping. So the routine in the middle is mapped to software component B here in the architecture and the routine on the right is mapped to software component C. And there is a dependency from B to C in the architecture model. And from the interpretation, the architecture verification can infer that calls between B and C are allowed. So routines that are mapped to B can call functions or routines that are mapped to C. So this dependency in the code is a valid one with respect to the architecture. We call this a convergence. And we can mark this dependency in the code as a valid one. Now let's investigate this dependency. Similarly to the dependency that we've seen before, 
This dependency corresponds to the fact that this routine in the code is calling this routine. And again, we can map this dependency to the architecture model. So the origin of this dependency in the code is software component B in the architecture and the target in the code is mapped to software component A in the architecture. However, if we look here, we see that there is a dependency from A to B, but not the other way around. So we do not have a dependency from B to A in the software architecture. So this call is not anticipated by the architecture model and therefore is a violation of the architecture model specification. This is called a divergence and is reported by the architecture verification process. So the process marks this dependency in the code as a violating dependency. After checking the dependencies in the code model, architecture verification also checks the dependencies in the architecture model. For example, this one here. And if we now look at the code model parts that are mapped to component A, respectively component B, we see that this dependency actually is not really needed because there is no code dependency from elements from A to code elements that are mapped to B. So we have some kind of an over-specification here. This dependency between A and B is not really needed if we look at the code. This can have a lot of um, origins. For example, it could be that there are still code parts developed that are not yet um, in this code model, or it could be a problem in the architecture could also be that this actually is really not needed. So this is an interesting finding and also a discrepancy between architecture and code. So architecture verification also reports this and we call this an absence. So now in this picture, we see the three scenarios that can occur and that are actually computed by the architecture verification approach. We see the convergences here. This is something where code and model, architecture model are in sync. So normally this is also not reported. Then we have divergences where we see that there is something going on in the code. There's a dependency in the code between two entities, but there is no corresponding dependency within the architecture. This can have multiple reasons. Maybe in the architecture, a dependency has been forgotten or in the code model, this actually is really not allowed and is something that can be dangerous and can also lead to bugs or faulty behavior. And we have seen the absence edges up here that represent some kind of an over-specification and also are worth investigating. It is advisable to embed the architecture verification check into a continuous analysis. For example, a good idea is to run the analysis each day or each night because, of course, code is changing and also the architecture model can change. The architecture verification check provides precise diagnostic information for divergences and absences. And the important thing and advantage to use it in a continuous analysis is that architects and developers can tackle findings very, very early. Yeah, so maybe ideally after the problem has occurred a day after, maybe it is, can already be fixed. And this actually 
is exactly the point that we need to assure that the architecture remains reliable. This is what brings us back to the beginning of our webinar. To sum up, we have seen that architecture verification requires an initial setup, four steps. If it's set up, it can detect deviations between architecture model and code model automatically. And so it improves code and architecture quality continuously. It detects flaws and assures that the architecture remains reliable and so helps to build future-proof software. Thanks a lot for your interest in architecture verification. If you have any more questions or would like to have additional information, please contact us at any time. You can also find information on our website. Thanks a lot again and have a great day. Bye.